Hello everyone! A laboratory power supply is one of the main devices in a radio enthusiast's lab. I have a lot of videos on my channel showing the assembly process of various laboratory power sources, but today, at the request of many viewers, we will assemble and test another circuit. The version presented online is very popular. Under the name Simple and Affordable Power Supply, it has an entire forum thread dedicated to it, developed by a person with the nickname Olegrams. You can find all the necessary links in the description. The circuit has been refined many times, and there are more than 10 versions in total. Quite some time ago, I made one of the most successful versions. I tested it, checked all its capabilities, and put it aside for a long time. This time, I was asked to make the very first version from the author. I assembled the circuit as it is, only designed my own board and replaced the operational amplifier with a different one. A few words about the circuit. It is a full-fledged laboratory power supply with both voltage and current stabilization. The output voltage adjustment range is from 0 to 25 volts, and the current will practically from 0 to amps. If that's not enough for you, the output voltage of the power supply can be made up to 50 volts, and the current up to 10 amps by adding power transistors. The circuit is completely linear, providing very smooth adjustment for both voltage and current. The ripple of the output voltage is minimal. In the end, we will, of course, test all of this. The heart of the circuit is a dual operational amplifier. In the left part of the circuit, a voltage regulator is assembled, and there are two of them. Why is this necessary, and why can't we make do with just one? The second regulator is 12 volts and quite good. But the problem is that you can supply voltage to its input, no more than 30 to 35 volts. However, the first one can easily handle higher voltages. But its output, voltage doesn't shine with stability. Here, one regulator compensates for the shortcomings of the other. It results in an analog of a high voltage regulator to which you can supply up to 50 volts. There's nothing particularly clever here. This option is suggested by the manufacturers of the regulator chips themselves if there's a need to use the chips in higher voltage circuits. During operation, they hardly heat up because they only power the operational amplifier, the current consumption of which is small. Operational amplifier, it is powered by the second voltage regulator, 12 volts. The original circuit uses an LM324 chip, which contains four operational amplifiers. Since only two channels are used in the circuit, I decided to replace the op amp with an LM358. It has exactly two independent operational amplifiers. This circuit is interesting because the current feedback controls the output voltage. When the power supply operates as a voltage regulator, the first operational amplifier works as a comparator and ensures a stable output. Voltage, which serves as a reference for the second amplifier on which the voltage regulation is based. The current limiting system is classic. A reference voltage is applied to the non-inverting input of the first operational amplifier through a divider. Next, when a load is connected, the voltage drop that forms on the current sensor is compared with the reference. Based on the difference, the state of the operational amplifier's output changes smoothly. By forcibly changing the reference voltage using a variable resistor, we can effectively make the operational amplifier change its output. Voltage, which will ultimately lead to the smooth opening or closing of the power transistor and the change in the output current of the power supply. The power transistor. In my case, it's a 2SD1047, an A23P package. It's quite high voltage with a collector current of 12A. The power dissipated by the collector is about 100W. It can be replaced with any other similar one with a collector current of at least 7A. It is preferable to use a transistor in A2247 package. Or 2.3. The circuit operates in linear mode, so the larger the transistor substrate, the better the heat dissipation. Common transistors like the 2N3055 suit. The transistor is mounted on a large heat sink. It may be necessary to additionally cool the heat sink with a fan. The heat sink I will be using during the experiments is inadequate. A much larger heat sink is needed. When selecting a transistor, it's important to consider the power dissipated by the collector and estimate, for example, a situation where the power supply output is set to, say, 1 volt and the maximum current is, let's assume, 1 amp. 
while 30 volts is applied to the input. In this case, the power at the power supply output will be only 1 watt, and the voltage drop across the transistor will be 29 volts. Considering the load current of 1 amp, we will get 29 watts of pure heat on the transistor. This is a linear mode, and there's nothing you can do about it. Of course, you can make a winding switch if you have a transformer with taps on the secondary winding. The switch will constantly monitor the voltage, and if it is low, will switch the winding, supplying a low voltage to the stabilizer input, thus easing the operating mode of the transistor. How to make the simplest switch? I have already shown this, you will find the link to the video in the description. Let's continue. The signal from the operational amplifier is inverted by a low power transistor and fed to the pre output switch, which actually controls the output transistor. The circuit includes two variable resistors for smooth and precise adjustment of the output voltage. A full turn of the fine tuning resistor allows for voltage adjustment within a range of about 3 volts. The specified resistor sets the limit of the output voltage. The minimum input output difference with this arrangement of components in the feedback loop will be about 5 to 7 V. While operating the source, I encountered the problem of fluctuating output voltage and spent about an hour trying to figure out what the issue was. I double checked the board and the soldering. The reason was extremely poor quality variable resistors. I recently ordered a batch of such resistors with different ratings. This is all to say be careful and with variable resistors. The Chinese have started making them poorly. And because of such a trick, many people are puzzled as to why circuits don't work as they should, blaming anyone they can. Be vigilant and only buy original components. About the printed circuit board. There are three jumpers on it. I could have done without them, but I was in a hurry during the layout, so it could have been better. But the board is fully functional, and you can download it along with the overall. Project Archive via the link in the description. The board includes a rectifier with an electrolytic capacitor for power. All you need to do is find the appropriate transformer and connect it to the board. All the power components that will heat up are located close together, for easy installation on a common heatsink. Moreover, all components are insulated from the heatsink with thermally conductive pads and plastic sleeves. The input rectifier has a current of 4 to 5A but it's preferable to use a 10 amp one. An electrolytic capacitor rated at 50 to 63 volts with a capacity of 2,200 microfarads or more. Let's start testing our stabilizer. First, something simple. Smoothness of adjustment, minimum output voltage. 30 volts are applied to the input. The maximum output voltage is about 23 volts. The minimum voltage is at zero. The adjustment is very smooth, you can set it to even 10 MV. The stabilizer's current consumption without load is about 10 to 20 milliamperes. But this will depend on the output voltage, as there is a load resistor at the output. And the higher the voltage, the more it will drop across this resistor. The current limitation works as it should. Under load, the current is smoothly adjustable. The upper limit is about A, the lower is 60 milliamperes. However, by adjusting the corresponding divider, you can make it even less. But, there is one small problem. If you try to short circuit the unit at minimum current, the current is not limited. If the transformer is powerful, the power transistor will be rendered useless. But it should be noted that such behavior of the unit is not observed if there is a load on the output. For example, performing the same test through an ammeter with sufficiently long probes, this problem did not occur. The flip side is that at maximum current, everything works perfectly. The unit handles short circuits. I should note that this drawback was mentioned on the forum, and it has been improved in subsequent versions. The next test checks the operation of the feedback, in other words, stabilization during sudden surges and drops in mains voltage. For those who are not aware, let me say that. The stabilizer should maintain the set output current and voltage values, regardless of changes in the input voltage. We will simulate the fluctuations using another laboratory power supply, which will actually power our stabilizer. The output voltage of the stabilizer is set to 12V.
Everything is great, the set voltage remains stable. Next, I set the output current to 1A and repeated the same test. Here, the unit also behaves appropriately. The output current does not change, everything is excellent. As mentioned earlier, the voltage of this power supply is controlled by the current. Hence the question, does this affect the response speed? Let me rephrase that. Will there be a spike in the output voltage at the moment the power supply is connected to the network? If yes, that's bad. We connect the output of the stabilizer to the oscilloscope. Power is supplied to the input from the laboratory source. In this mode, I tested the stabilizer quite thoroughly and for a long time. I did not observe any suspicious spikes at the moment of turning on. Immediately after turning on, the set voltage is established at the output with no surges. And finally, the standard test for output voltage ripple. The current at the stabilizer's output is 1A. Type of load. A regular resistor. The average ripple value is 17 to 25 MV. This is a high value, considering that about 2 to 3 MV is added by my laboratory power supply, which, in fact, powered the stabilizer, plus the switching noise present in my studio. I have repeatedly mentioned that I have many devices operating here, including noisy, switching power supplies, which affect the oscilloscope probes. But despite this, we have only 20 to 25 MV, which is quite pleasing. Let's move on to the conclusions. Overall, considering the simplicity of the original circuit, it is quite good. The stabilization works correctly, and the ripple is within normal limits. The unit handles most standard operating modes without any issues. Thanks to its high stability, it can be used for demanding loads. Naturally, it can also be used as a full-fledged CVCC charger. It's perfect for lithium batteries, provided, of course, that it doesn't bother you. Linear mode of operation. Many shortcomings have long been corrected in other versions of the circuit. All of this has been discussed and refined on the forum. I highly recommend studying it before starting the assembly. As I already mentioned, you can reduce the load on the power transistor by adding a mains transformer with taps on the secondary winding and a switching system. The circuit is versatile, the output current and voltage can be increased. For today, I think that's all. You will find all the necessary links in the description, including the link to the project archive with my printed circuit board. Don't forget to rate the video and subscribe to my Instagram. Well, I'll say goodbye for a short while. As always, this was Kazian K with you, and until we meet again.